Hello, colleagues and friends. Welcome to this new edition of this PCR webinar dedicated to the use of drug coating balloons, what you expect to see at follow-up from a different approach of PCR. This will be a continuation of what we have discussed some months ago during the first webinar in complex cases treated with drug coating balloons. This is a webinar sponsored by an unrestricted grant from Medtronic and organized by our colleagues, Professor Bruno Scheller and Michael Jonner and myself. Uh, we hope uh, you enjoyed the previous version of, uh, of this uh, webinar because today we will give you some more information and hints. So uh, we hope uh, you are interested on discussing with us which are the strategies on how to deal with the specific situations, clinical and angiographic. We will share with you opinions coming from the web because you can chat with me and I can address to our experts your, your, your questions. And, uh, and then to see together cases from real life after some presentations, because we need data to support what we are going to say. So, with no further delay, the first speaker uh, will be Michael, Professor Yonar, who will tell us about what we know on the long-term results of uh, instant restenosis treated with uh, drug coating balloon. Michael. Thank you very much, um, Flavio. Um, this is uh, um, my pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar again, and it's a fantastic uh, way to present the data so that we have a follow-up of what we have seen previously. So let me first introduce you into what we know about the late outcomes of drug coated balloons. And I want to start with this slide, just highlighting the significant issue of instant restenosis. And we have reported and understood the mechanisms of stent failure from pathology, from seminal autopsy studies that showed basically that there are several mechanisms underlying something that we clinically manifest as either restenosis or stent thrombosis. And as you can see, certainly the mechanisms differ between cases presenting early versus late. And today we talk about the late outcomes. It is important again to say that restenosis is an important mechanism um, that cannot basically be understood completely from clinical perspective. Now, um, it is also clear, I think, that instant restenosis is a very significant problem. Now, when I'm showing you this slide, it shows you that in our large registry in Munich, we saw that when we introduced second-generation drug eluding stents, um, there was a decline um, with regards to instant restenosis. Nevertheless, we see that restenosis is associated with significant mortality compared to patients that don't have restenosis. And in the, in the third part of this slide, you can see that um, there's a steady increase in instant restenosis over time, which means even beyond five years, six years, eight years, uh, there's no uh, decrease in the incidence and late incidence of instant restenosis. Why are drug coated balloons so important in this regard? Simply because they allow us to dilate these stenotic restenotic lesions. Um, they really transfer significant amounts of drug to the vessel wall so that we can overcome this problem of instant restenosis. And most importantly, I believe uh, there is absence of long-standing stent struts, which reduces chronic vessel injury. And this plays an important role as we have also learned from the first series of these webinars. Now, let us look into the late outcomes. Now, now what do we really know? This is 12 months data from the PREVAIL study. This is the uh, drug coated balloon using um, paclitaxel and urea as excipient. And you can see more, slightly more than 50% of the patients presented here. It's a small study, only 64, uh, for, uh, 64 subjects, nevertheless, um, presented with instant restenosis. And what you can see here is that we see excellent outcome even at long-term 12 months um, with low rates of um, late loss, 0.12 millimeters and also um, single digit to 10% uh, to um, uh, TVF rates and also MACE rates uh, in this drug coated balloon. Now, what do we know about real long-term outcomes beyond the first year? And there's certainly one um, uh, study to highlight, which is the uh, data loss project. Um, it's a individual patient level data pooled meta-analysis um, that was performed by my colleagues, uh, Robert Byrne and Daniele Ciacopo, 
um, as the lead authors here, you can see the inclusion criteria where that these had to be randomized trials that were included in this meta-analysis focusing on coronary instant restenosis. And they had to investigate either drug-coated balloons alone or drug-eluting stents alone. You can see the different trials that were included here. Um, it was a study throughout Europe and also uh, in China. And uh, the main data are shown here. You can see the outcome up to three years for the drug-coated balloon group in blue and for the drug-eluting stent group in orange. And what you see with regards to target lesion revascularization was there was a slight um, benefit towards drug-eluting stents in this, group, in this cohort of, of patients. And this was mostly derived from the single-stage analysis. Now, when we look on the right panel of the slide to the dual-stage analysis, you can see a landmark analysis beyond the first year. There was no difference any longer between drug-coated balloons and drug-eluting stents. So the most difference seemed to occur in TLR uh, between drug-eluting stents and drug-coated balloons within the first year. Now, when we applied a random effects model um, for this meta-analysis, you can also see that the significant difference was lost uh, between drug-eluting stents and drug-coated balloons. Now, some important facts that I also want to highlight um, in, in the next slide, which is unfortunately not moving, um, was the fact uh, regarding mortality. Thank you so much. One back, please. Um, with regards to mortality, um, I can tell you that uh, there was also significantly um, increased mortality um, for the group that uh, with of drug eluding stents. Now, if you can move to the next slide, I'm very sorry, I lost connection here. Yes, uh, when we further dive into this, you can see that there was no significant difference um, when patients presented with bare metal stent restenosis. However, there was still a significant difference in the patients with drug-eluting stent restenosis. And I think this is a very important uh, message also that drug-eluting stent restenosis seems to be very difficult to treat. Next slide, please. Um, I have already alluded to the fact that uh, mortality was an issue. And you can see that in this analysis, there was a very strong trend, although it did not reach statistical significance for higher mortality in the drug-eluting stent group as compared to the drug-coated um, balloon group. Next slide, please. And if you dive even deeper into this and you split between paclitaxel eluding stents, so the older generation and the newer generation, Everolimus and Biolimus eluding stents, you can see that in the paclitaxel eluding stent group, there was a significant increase for mortality compared to drug-coated balloons. I was alluding to the fact that it is extremely important to look at real long-term data and the real long-term data can be derived beyond three years from a study, which is the ESA DESIRE 3 trial. Uh, and, and that's a study that compared drug-coated balloons, uh, which in this case was the sequent please balloon, uh, compared to a drug-eluting stent and plain old balloon angioplasty. And um, this study had follow-up now up to 10 years, and I'm showing you really relatively hot data that had just been accepted for publication in the European Heart Journal. And this study was led by my colleagues, uh, Daniele Giacopo and Sebastian Kufner. And what they found was that when you compare drug-coated balloons and drug-eluting stents, they were both significantly more effective in reducing the primary endpoint, which was a composite of cardiac death, target vessel myocardial infarction, target vessel thrombosis, and target lesion revascularization. And you can see this was both significantly reduced compared to all plain old balloon angioplasty without any significant difference among these um, groups. Um, which tells us that up to 10 years drug-coated balloons are really effective and really have no, um, let's say, less uh, effectiveness as compared to, um, at, in this stage, uh, paclitaxel eluding stents. And that already brings me uh, to my summary, um, which I want to conclude. Uh, the fact that drug-coated balloon technology has really been established as clinically effective uh, alternative to repeat stenting in the setting of instant restenosis. Long-term data of drug-coated balloons in the setting of instant restenosis is mainly derived from large-scale meta-analysis of IPD data, which I have shown up to three years of follow-up, and the ISA DESIRE 3 trial up to 10 years of follow-up. Um, at longer-term follow-up, DCB seemed to be similarly effective in the treatment of ISR compared to drug-eluting stents, with some advantage for drug-eluting stents, especially the newer ones, uh, with regards to anti-restenotic efficacy, 
but also a trend towards increased mortality. And we have to tease this out in future uh, randomized trials. And I personally believe, and this is my note, giving the avoidance of an additional stent layer, drug-coated balloon technology should be considered as first choice for the treatment of instant restenosis. Thank you very much, Flavio. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this clear presentation. Uh, well, we are running now with six minutes of delay because of the technical issue, but I think it's very important to give room to the questions that are coming from the chat from our colleagues because it makes this more interesting and, um, and, particip and participation is important. There is a smart question uh, to both of you. It's based on your experience. The colleague asked, Gianluca Tiberti asked, if you have a very large investor with instant stenosis with a diameter which is bigger than five millimeters, and we don't have drug coating balloons of that size, what do we do? Can we put two drug eluding balloons in, in the instant stenosis? Can you give your opinion very shortly, the two of you? We start with Bruno. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes and no. You, what you have to do is you have to uh, reschedule the timing of your lesion preparation because um, to have a full contact uh, in the case of a five millimeter uh, restenotic stand, and, and we have only 4.0 dcb at maximum size, uh, you have you can do lesion preparation, let's say, with a 3.5 balloon first, then use dcb, and then afterwards uh, use a bigger balloon, uh, uh, in best case, a non compliant uh, balloon with high pressure um, for the final size of 5.0. Okay. Michael, would you do the same thing or you have a different uh, suggestion? No, in general, it's certainly the same. I mean, oftentimes when you have severe restenosis, you have the advantage that, you know, the stent is not, the lumen is no longer five millimeters. So it's, you know, it's much narrower uh, in a way and you can get along well with 4.0 um, uh, drug coated balloons. I never had this situation that you really have such a large vessel in the setting of instant renosis. Otherwise, I would fully concur with what uh, Bruno said. Okay. So now we go to one case with the real. So please, if we can start showing the presentation. It, it's a case I have been personally following for many years. It's a, it's a patient that was young the first time when he came to my observation. And now it's less young because many years have passed. And uh, briefly, this is his story. Uh, he was uh, 56 when he had F4 angina and he was treated elsewhere. He was implanted in 2006 when he was 50. Um, three cipher stents from proximal to the mid LAD and one cipher in the right coronary artery. Actually, he did well. He did well from, 2000, from 2006 to 2013 when he had the recurrence of chest pain. And this is when I first met him. You see the right coronary artery is okay with his cipher stent who has been there for six or seven years, but the OCL LED is totally occluded. And you can see that there is a long train of uh, stents uh, in the LED. So of course, as it is recommended by the guidelines, I've started by performing an IBUS and you can see that the IBUS shows that the stents were well expanded. It's all based on neointimal hyperplasia and thrombosis. Then a rapid test of the viability of the anterior wall, which seems okay. It's hypo, hypoakinetic, but the patient is young. And so what I did was an easy canalization with an hydrophilic wire, nothing like a total occlusion. It won very easily. And of course, as the stents were well uh, expanded, I just treat the patients with balloons Drug coating balloons were not available in my center at that time. And what I saw was the, a quite acceptable result on the LAD, but I didn't like the result on the diagonal. So you see the, the, the stents now are clean after the dilatation with only balloon on the LAD. And he um, had recurrence of uh, angina six months later. So this is the new angiogram. The right is good again. And you see that the LED, it's again occluded because there are collaterals and everything is as it was. It was a total occlusion of both the LED and the diagonal. 
probably there was an image escaping, but there was a stenting on the diagonal. And again, a check on the NB function, which was more or less like before. The patient was symptomatic for angina. So at that time, the question was, surgery is difficult because of this extensive stenting of the LAD. Pulver didn't work. I don't like the idea of putting more stents. And finally, drug coating balloons became available. So what I did after a predilatation was treating with DCB, the LAD. This is a 2.540. At that time was the Impact Falcon Metronic Balloon. A 330 in the proximal part, a 2.5 going to the diagonal, which went quite easily. That's the drug delivery on the diagonal, and another drug coating balloon on the ostium. So uh, these are four drug coating balloons, and this is the final result. It's good flow, and geographically, of course, doesn't look like stenting. The ostium of the diagonal seems to be, of course, dissected or somehow affected. But this is what happens when you don't implant more stents. Nevertheless, with this outcome, the patient did very well. And he came to my observation one year later. And I was so curious to see how the angiogram was looking that he accepted to undergo another angiogram. And you see that now there are no collaterals. And this is the one year follow up after these four drug coating balloons. The, flu, the flow is very good. Of course, there is distal disease. The diagonal, it's okay. And this is the final image. And now you can see that the LV function is normalized. So all the LV is viable. And according to the occlusion, it went in hibernation. And with the reperfusion, he became normal. So I tell you the story. The patient did very well for nine years. The ejection fraction remains 55. He was under only aspirin, beta blockers, and ACE inhibitor. And just a couple of months ago, he came back to me. He was coming every year. And this time he came saying, he's a farmer. He works very hard. And he said, I still feel some chest pain again. So I was very curious to see the result after nine years of this drug coating balloon intervention, and he accepted to come for the coronary angiogram last month. So what we can see now is that the right coronary artery is having some progression of the disease. It's not as nice as it used to be, but the segment treated with the cipher still looks great. You see some collaterals to the LAD, and indeed, what I found is a focal tight restenosis of the LAD. With normal flow, without pain at rest, and a short restenosis of the diagonal. Okay? So this is the outcome after nine years, after two very aggressive diffuse proliferative restenosis, very well for nine years, and now he's coming back with two focal instant restenosis. So, any comment on that, Bruno? What would you do at this point? I mean, what, what we see here is, um, I think, neoarteriosclerosis. This is very probable, uh, and it's focal. Um, so, I do not think there's a need for, for another new layer of metal in this situation. Um, imaging, of course, would be helpful to see if the, the stent is uh, still fully expanded. Um, and if this is not the case, you have to address this with, with uh, leash preparation. Um, and if, if it's fully expanded, I think a, another local truck delivery after nine years is, is a good option without new stent. Okay. But why you think that the stent could be not well expanded? It, it was well expanded from the beginning. I mean, I did the IGOS. 10 years before, mm. and I didn't think to repeat the IVOS. Yeah, but, but maybe you can have calcification or, or, or something like that, meanwhile, in this area. This could uh -huh. be the case. Okay. Well, I have to admit that uh, I didn't do. I just went with the uh, Lucian balloon dilatation. And uh, let me wait until the clicker reconnects. Okay.
There we go. This is other incidence. You see, I think that the osseal lesion of the diagonal is before the stent and is actually, as you said, it's neatherosclerosis progression in this long-term follow-up. This is balloon preparation with a 2.5 millimeters in the LED and a 2.5 millimeters in the diagonal. And after is the drug coating. It's a prevail 330 on the LED and a prevail 2.520 on the diagonal. And this is the final result. So I wanted to share with you this because I think it's not usual to have uh, such a long-term follow-up and such a successful outcome after such a difficult beginning because the guy had total occlusion, diffuse restenosis with the cipher, very long stented tracks, first generation stents. After balloon, he had recurrence, but he had an incredible response to the first generation, I'd say, drug-eluting balloons that was done nearly 10 years ago. So I wanted to share with you that if uh, you have any comment on this. Michael? Yeah, I think um, you did quite well, I must say. You, you, you had a lot of courage to treat this by that time, only with drug coated balloons. But I, I must say that you did the perfectly right thing. Because you can see, in my opinion, if the stents already performed didn't perform well in this patient, as we know, because they were completely occluded, it is very likely that if you had extended the stents in the LAD in the mid and distal, would have probably occluded again at this point of time. And now I think you can get away with a focal instant restenosis, even if it's the second time. But I think, as Bruno mentioned, after second delivery of drug, I would also use a drug coated balloon again after lesion preparation. You have very high chance to really be fine with this particular lesion, in my opinion. Okay, we will know about the future because the guy, of course, is an aficionado to our lab and he will be coming back. So we will talk about this guy for the next years. Now, uh, there is indication, recommendation for treating instant restenosis in the European guidelines with drug coating balloons. It's a very strong one, it's 1A, but it's different when we talk about native arteries. We will show later the follow up of the case we showed in our previous webinar. Now I'd like to ask my friend Bruno to provide us some updates on what's new on the long-term follow-up of treating de novo arteries. Okay, thank you very much, Flavio. Um, the, as you said, the, the ISR indication is the, um, the accepted indication uh, for the use of DCB. However, in my opinion, this is the not the best indication because we have we have the best outcome uh, if we use DCP to for a strategy we call DCP only, which is aimed to to reduce the number and length of stents we implant in patients. Why does it make sense? Um, here you can see uh, one of the many papers uh, looking at long term outcomes after uh, drug loading stents, and we know that after the first year there is an ongoing event rate independent if it's a metal stand, a first generation or a later generation drug lutex stand, which is a device-based event rate of up to 2% per year. And so far, there is no sign that, that this event uh, will stop. And, and therefore, even in younger patients, it makes sense to reduce the number of stands. And this is very famous work from Michael. Um, I, I will show you again. Um, he showed very elegantly that in the in the early phase after stenting, we have to discuss uh, the thrombotic risk due to malopposition, due, uh, due to limited endothelialization. But later on, on long term, uh, with, with stents, we we uh, we are talking about neoarteriosclerosis, which is more frequent with drug eluting stents uh, than with uh, bare metal stents. Um, and therefore, this algorithm of TCB only is aimed to um, identify those lesions that require stenting uh, and those lesions that do not require the radial force of the stent but only um, um, are sufficiently treated if you do local drug delivery. And the focus on this concept is on lesion preparation and you should do this as best as you can, as aggressive as you can, uh, with a balloon to vessel ratio of uh, one to one. And after that, you have to decide if this is an acceptable result or not, not a stent-like, an acceptable result. And with angiographic criteria, which means that you should have no flow-limiting dissection, but dissections type A and B are fine. 
uh, dissections are the mechanism of angioplasty. Um, and you should uh, limit the, the uh, residual stenosis of maximum to 30%. And if this is required, then, then this concept says uh, this lesion is suitable for this only. What happens afterwards? Within the first few months after treating uh, the novo lesion with a pactitaxel coated balloon only, we see an effect that is very unique for DCB only treatment. It's called late loom enlargement. This means uh, even if you have a not stent like result in the beginning, your vessel gets bigger over time, and this occurs typically within the first four to six months. And here in this MLD distribution, you can see a shift from the left to the right. And this is really un unique for this uh, uh, treatment. And what is the, the mechanism behind it? Uh, the, the first and, and most frequent mechanism is uh, growth in total vessel size. So we have an increase in vessel area over time. And this is accompanied by an increase in, in lumen area. Um, and um, it had also uh, been shown that um, if you look at uh, bifurcations where you treat only the main branch of the DCB, the origin of the side branch also increases. And this is, this is a very interesting uh, feature of this treatment. This is a um, clinical example for one of the earlier bifurcation trials we did. Uh, in the circumflex, we treated both uh, arms uh, with uh, DCB, um, 3.0 uh, each. And the final result was not perfect. There was dissection, there was haziness, the initial loom gain in the, in the main circ was, was not really that perfect. But at six months, you see that this dissection is healed and the lumen has increased. And this is what we typically will see after pactitaxel coated balloons. And in this patient, we looked also with IBUS um, at the treated lesion at six months. And we saw a much lower uh, area of plaque in the DCB treated area than in the areas uh, proximal and distally to the treat area, which looked angiographically healthy. And this, this was very interesting to see that there seemed to be some influence on uh, the plaque um, uh, area and volume. And there's also experimental data showing that with uh, pactitaxel coated balloons, there seems to be a, a, a suppression of the progression and the inflammation um, of um, arteriosclerosis. And Recently, uh, this uh, trial from Japan uh, confirmed that an additional mechanism to this uh, uh, enlargement of the whole vessel area uh, is a reduction in black area in some of the lesions. So we have as a concept what happens after DCB-only treatment. Uh, we have an increase in total uh, lumen due to an increase in total vessel area and or a decrease uh, in arteriosclerosis. Um, another very important feature is the restoration of vasomotion after DCP only treatment. Um, this is experimental work uh, from Korea with, with ergovine testing and nitro testing, showing that uh, DCP treated areas uh, show full vasomotion. And this is another uh, uh, trial uh, looking at uh, the comparison between DCP treatment and uh, tracheolutic stand treatment. And here again, you see that in the treated, treatment, uh, treated segment, of course, the, the stand cannot adapt to, uh, to the, uh, uh, the different situations, but the DCB treated segment uh, has vasomotion. And this is also the case in the areas distally to the treated segment. So this is very unique. You have an increase in lumen over time and you have uh, vasomotion again, which is different to a stand treatment. Uh, this is a, another example of a trifurcation treatment, uh, no stand at all. Um, and if you look at the initial uh, result in the left and uh, the result after 13 months, you can see again dissections are healed and the lumen has increased. Um, what are the data from the trials? Um, the first trial looking at small vessel disease was the, the Bello trial by Asima Latib and Antonio Colombo. They randomized at this time the taxo stand uh, against the impact Falcon DCB. And at six months, there was an angiographic benefit by the DCB against this first uh, generation drug load extends. And if you look at three years follow up, also there was a significant difference in clinical events, mainly driven uh, by death and myocardial infarction. 
Um, a larger trial, 758 patients randomized in small vessel disease source the basket small. A two trial where we uh, meanwhile published also the three years follow up. And in this trial, there was uh, no uh, difference in um, event rate in MACE uh, between uh, uh, current generation drug looting stents and uh, the DCB only concept. Um, maybe somewhat disappointing because we hope that after the first year there would be benefit of the uh, DCB treated uh, patients. However, we have to be aware that uh, most of these patients had also interventions in larger vessels and, and those were treated with, with uh, drug eluting stents in most cases. So this is maybe the case where we see no difference, but we see a very similar outcome at three years between DCB only and stents. If you look in more detail in this trial, in the angiographic substudy, there was no single occlusion of the DCB treated small vessels, but a relevant number of uh, occluded stents uh, which were treated during this, this study. Another um, trial uh, with three years follow up, a randomized trial is the debit trial uh, conducted by Thomas Roussan and his colleagues. They looked at patients at high bleeding risk against spare metal stand, which is a limitation of this trial. But if you look at the event rate in the DCB group, this was very low. And um, even after three years, the new event rate was lower in the DCB group than in the stand. Um, um, if you look at all the available data from randomized trials, uh, including those trials uh, comparing DCB with alternative treatments for instant restenosis and those for the de novo disease, uh, we identified 4,590 patients from six, 26 randomized trials. And what we saw is that within the first year, there was a significant lower rate of myocardial infarction in DCB-treated patients. This under this supports the, the safety of this approach working with outstanding. Um, and at three years, there was a lower mortality in the DCB-treated patients, and this was driven by cardiac mortality. Uh, what about data beyond um, three years? Uh, unfortunately, so far, we have only limited data here. For example, here a series from um, Simon Eckelshaw's group in the UK. They uh, report five year follow up in the novo seas comparing Paclitaxel coated balloons with uh, non Paclitaxel uh, coat, uh, coated second generation drug eluting stents. There was no significant difference, but event rates at longer follow up were at least numerically lower with the DCB concept. Um, so my conclusion is that, um, especially for the novo disease, paclitaxel coated balloons are the standard of care. In the coronary arteries, um, lesion preparation is very important if you consider uh, a lesion not to be treated with a stent, but with a, a drug coated balloons. Um, and what we see is that uh, we can, of course, reduce stent associated events if we do not implant a stent. Uh, including potentially neoatosclerosis. We see late lumen enlargement uh, when not cage, caging a vessel, and uh, very important also is vasomotion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruno. I will take the advantage of this talk to address you some questions that are coming from our colleagues. Uh, one of the most frequent um, is, is coming from uh, Manoy Monto Almeida. How uh, confidently can we leave dissections when, when we treat the coronaries just with balloon and without the stents? Which is your secret? Um, there is no secret. It is, it's well known since the beginning of angioplasty that, that type A and B lesions have an excellent outcome and a very low risk of uh, vessel closure. Um, and what has not been systematically been investigated, but it should be the case that dual antiplatelet therapy, similar to the stents, will only reduce the, the uh, vessel closure rate with DCB treatment. So we select the lesions by aggressive lesion preparation, and we have dual antiplatelet therapy. And that's the reason why we do not see uh, acute and subacute vessel closure, not, not more frequent than after stent. Indeed, what you have shown is that the incidence of infarction is lower after DCB compared to stent. So uh, acute and subacute stent thrombosis is more frequent than the acute occlusion because of dissections. Is that okay? Yeah, 
But again, you have to follow the rules of, of GCP only. This means lesion preparation has to, be done, uh, has to be done very carefully, and you have to follow these rules. Don't, don't leave type Z dissections if you start with such a, a treatment. Okay. And a very short question to Michael. Uh, is there still a room for brachytherapy in this diffuse instant restenosis as the case I showed? Yeah, that's that's a good and difficult question to answer. I, I think they're not, you know, I don't know if their center still doing a, a brachytherapy. Um, I personally believe I have seen, you know, coronary vessels after brachytherapy. And the problem is that you induce heavy delayed healing. That means that the artery has to catch up, has to heal at a later time point. And I'm not a, a believer of this therapy. Um, I was never and I also don't believe that there is still a place for it. Okay. So now we move to another case. Uh, please show me the next case, case number two. It's a, it's a patient we showed a couple of months ago during the first uh, webinar dedicated to DCB. It's an elderly male, a hypertensive diabetic um, with a chronic AFib under oral anticoagulation. He came to the hospital more than a year ago because of uh, active bleeding from the urinary tract and um, a troponin rise, which was of course accounting for a non-STEMI, the emergency coronary angiogram put the indication to PCI, but because of the active bleeding, we managed the patient medically with infusion and control of blood pressure, and he did well. And he could undergo emergency surgery, and uh, a part of the tumor was removed from the gut bladder and he stopped bleeding. So after that, on day four, we loaded with Plavix. You can see the ACG, it's not good quality, but the ACG changes were minor in the anterior wall. Uh, as I said, it's a very high reading based patient because of age, because of the oral anticoagulation, because he had renal dysfunction and he had anemia uh, plus G cancer because unfortunately what was f taken from the gut bladder was a tumor uh, with the initial level of malignancy, not invasive, but still uh, he had to undergo radiotherapy. As you can see, the right coronary artery, it's a big vessel, it's a dominant, very calcified, but without uh, focal lesions. And uh, the problem seems to be the LAD. You see that the LAD has a big mm, diagonal, which is a uh, uh, accounting for half of the circulation of the anterior wall. The LV function is good. I mean, there is a mild hypokinesia of the anterior wall, but basically it's a good LV function. And this is the, the image we have with the guiding catheter before performing the angioplasty. You see that the vessels are small, uh, very calcified, and the lesions are very tight. It's a kind of 0 1, one bifurcation lesion. So my question is uh, to Bruno, would you consider this patient for DCB alone? Um, I would consider it, as we always do, for lesion preparation first. Um, and depending on the result of lesion preparation, uh, I would decide if it will end up in two DCB, in a DCB plus a stand or in two stands. That's, that's the strategy. Okay. That's perfect. This is very clear message. This is exactly what I do. And we have discussed this uh, several times. And what you see is that I start with the balloon. It's a non-compliant 2.5, and the balloon is not expanding well on the LAD, despite the high pressure. Then the same balloon goes to the diagonal, and I had the impression that in the diagonal there is better expansion. So I put a 2.520 prevail uh, drug coating balloon on the diagonal. But I was not happy with the preparation on the LAT, so I upgraded a little bit the aggressiveness of the preparation, and with a 2.510 millimeters drug, uh, cutting balloon, now you see that the expansion is better. And then with the DCB 27520, there is a good expansion of the drug coating balloon on the LAD. So at that point, I was satisfied. I did a final keys with the, with the diagonal just to fix the carina. And uh, this is the final angiographic result. 
Uh, Michael, would you comment on these results? Would you leave these dissections, these uh, residual stenosis? Would you trust these or you would go with the stent? Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a good case, uh, Flavio. I love this case. Um, it's it's a difficult question. I, I must be very transparent. You know, it's a learning phase because initially, when you see this, I guess nine out of ten operators would switch to bailout stenting at least for the LAD where you have a dissection. Now, if we have listened to what Bruno had said with regards to type of dissections, I think you can leave this. Um, there is still a m minor chance that you will end up in an occlusion, but with the contemporary um, DAPT treatment, antiplatelet treatment, I think we will see some late lumen enlargement over time. And yes, I, I think you can leave this as it is. Okay, so we see this is what I did. The flow is good. The patient has no uh, pain. The ACG is normal. The right sections and the diurnal, the LAD. But it's a very high risk patient because of the high bleeding of uh, high bleeding risk. He's needing our oral anticoagulation and he's needing further surgery. So I didn't implant the stent. The patient did well. We did the the, the QFR analysis. You see that it was below 0.80 before and it was above 91 on the LAD. So the result is functionally acceptable. He had no in-hospital complications. He was discharged on triple therapy. Aspirin was stopped uh, one week later. Uh, the platyx was stopped after one month. And since 30 days, he remained with only the, the new oral anticoagulation. And after 30 days, he underwent the radiotherapy. He did very well, and I asked him to come back. This is the case we discussed uh, previously, and now I am showing you the follow-up. In the meantime, he developed AD block. And so you see it's an implantation of mica in less... Uh, no, no, sorry, this is um, a loop recorder because, because uh, to have a good control of his AFib, and you can see the result of the LAD and the diagonal. This is the functional testing before PCI and after one year. So you see that there is practically no loss of uh, efficacy, and these, are, and these are the angiographic images. So, which is your comment? Yeah, I think well done. I mean, it's exactly what we didn't know that it turns out to be a very excellent result in the long term. I think you saw some minor positive remodeling, not that much as you know you may have expected actually. But I also believe, Flavio, that this was a heavily calcified artery. Um, so uh, you know there is a, a limit towards uh, positive vessel remodeling, even you know with drug coated balloons in these highly calcified arteries. The question I always have to myself is that if I had to you know, bail out to, let's say, rotablation or even more aggressive predilatation uh, um, lesion preparation methods. Can we still go with drug-coated balloons in this case? Is that something you can, you can elaborate on? Well, on my experience, uh, preparation is clue. If after, drug, uh, after in, in doing rotablation, you have a very good expansion of the balloon and if you want to try the drug coating balloon and you have a nice expansion and you have no residual stenosis and mild uh, let's say benign dissection you can leave it but the reason why you leave it is because this is a very high bleeding space more because you want to avoid the stent these are all patients you can put stent but are small vessels so i think the less metal you implant the better it can be of course, if the lesion preparation is not good because of the calcium, you have to implant a stent and expand it high pressure and get it to the side. Yeah. So, uh, we have 10 minutes left. We had some technical issues, so we have uh, seven or eight minutes late. What do we do? Uh, we keep on discussing or we show another case? What would be your feeling? Can we have, I asked to the to the student, can we have five or seven minutes additional or we have to finish? We can have five minutes, okay. Okay, so show us the next case. We will go through a case of, uh, again, a de novo lesion on native vessels. 
This will be a case of a young patient with long-term follow-up that uh, will address one of the issues is coming more and more frequently from the chat, which is the evaluation of the dissections. Can go through cases. Show me the first. That's it. It's a reconstruction of uh, LED in a young patient. At that time, he was uh, 57, and he came with chest pain at rest with a mild increment on troponin. You see some ATG changes in the anterior wall and the distal septal apical echinacea with relatively good LV function. This is the angiogram. It's actually a total occlusion of the mid LAD. And of course, we are not going to address the issue of treating total occlusions with DCB, which is still a little bit, uh, let's say, arguable. Uh, so we open the vessel first. It's not a chronic total occlusion. It's an acute occlusion. It's an acute coronary syndrome. So what you see now is the diffuse disease of the LAD. It's a large vessel, but there is a very diffuse disease in the distal part, despite <clears throat> the young age of the patient. So we are talking about many years ago, nearly nine or 10 years ago. So what we did was because of the young age of the patient, addressing the total occlusion with an absorbed scaffold. This is a 3.5 absorb. 23 millimeters long, post dilated with a non compliant balloon. And this is the final result. But we address the distal disease with the impact falcon. This is a 330. And as you can see, the angiogram looks very nice. Uh, can I ask you, uh, Bruno, if, on your opinion, there is some important dissection on this vessel in the distal part? I, I, I would say yes. Um, I can't, I, it's, it, the quality is not good enough to say it's type A or B, but uh, it's for sure not type C and you have good flow and you have uh, no high grade residual stenosis. So it's, it's for every case, it's accept, an acceptable result after the stroke. I was saying that when you look at the, at the balloon only results, the dissections may be much worse than what they are really angiographically. And this, of course, will induce you to implant stents, but this is not the case. Flow, ACG, clinic, and angiography should be more than enough, and probably physiology. We will see. This is a four-year selected follow-up. So you see that the vessel is well patent. There is some positive remodeling, especially where the BVS has been absorbed. There is some vessel enlargement at the point of the occlusion but this looks very nice. And also the distal disease, which was very long and diffuse, that was addressed only with the drug coating balloon, looks very nice. And of course, I will share with you the four years follow-up OCT of the vessel, starting from the distal part. And we will learn uh, what, what is the, the rule. I mean, after some months, a dissection is uh, again healed. And you see that in the bifurcations, there are no stents. The media looks great. This is a non-calcified vessel. There are no residual dissections. And of course, the artery wall looks practically as a normal one. And even in the part that was treated with the, with the BVS, which we are entering now, you see that there is a complete reabsorption, still some images in the media that there is no residual stenosis and there is a good total reabsorption of the, of the absorb. So this is how the vessel looks after four years. The eyes here are the sections that had the dissections after the, the balloon dilatation. And after four years, there is complete healing with actually, you see here, the longitudinal reconstruction, the dissections, which are completely gone at four years, and there is some positive remodeling of the distal part of the LAD. So this is another example of the novel lesion. This is a combination of absorbing the proximal part because it was a total occlusion 
and DCB only. Uh, I want to hear briefly your comments and your experience, if you have, regarding these long-term um, results, ANJO or OCT or IBUS in the Novo vessels. Let's start with Bruno. Um, Flavio, I think this is a very, very elegant case. And, and I, I, I think the, the idea um, of combining uh, bioresorbable scaffolds with uh, DCB is, is very appealing because we have to be aware that um, if you do lesion preparation, uh, in real life, about half of the lesions require stenting. Uh, that's my personal experience with more compact next lesions. So, and for those lesions at the moment, we have uh, current generation tracheolytic stents, which, which are very good, of course. But if we will follow this path of um, um, vascular restoration and, and vasomotion and all these things for all lesions, then it makes a lot of sense to combine uh, both technologies if we have a new generation of, of, of scaffolds in, in the future. And number one. Number two, um, as discussed before, what we see in the majority of cases after pachytaxial coated balloons is uh, lumen enlargement. Uh, we have to address issues like uh, calcification, as discussed before. If you have uh, a lot of calcification, uh, you do not see this, uh, this at that amount. But if you have not, not a big amount of calcification, then it looks like you demonstrated it typically. And dissections, non-flow limit dissections are helpful uh, and improve the outcome to my, to my experience. Great. Michael, your experience on this long-term follow-up in uh, patients treated on de novo lesions? Yeah, I think um, uh, Bruno has uh, elegantly elaborated to that. What I always find very impressive, uh, and your case illustrated this nicely, is the fact that even by OCT you can see dissections, and you have shown this nicely. Um, it was not for the entire circumference, not even, I think, between quarter to half of the circumference was affected. But you can see that this heals over time, and I think we had too many reflexes in the past to just put in stents when you see minor dissections, especially when you use OCT imaging. And I think this is an important learning of this case. Good. We have some time for addressing questions coming from, from our colleagues. Uh, Salim Buddha asked if there is experience of uh, using DCB in patients presenting with ST elevation MI. Bruno. Yes, yes, there is. There's uh, even a randomized trial uh, from colleagues from, from the Netherlands. Um, and they randomized current generation truck looting stands against uh, struck coated balloons in the ST elevation myocardial infarction. And they looked at uh, functional measurements uh, at follow up, and this, it was always, always the same. Uh, there are pros and cons in um, thrombus containing lesions in STEMI patients. Number one, if you have thrombus, there's a transfer barrier for, for the truck, and you have only this single balloon inflation. That means you have to do, um, again, good lesion preparation and have to get risk, uh, rid of the majority of the thrombus, number one. That's, that's the con. The pro is that um, frequently in STEMI patients, you underestimate the, the real vessel size and implant two stents, which are a little bit too small, typically. And uh, with the DCB approach, you avoid this. You will not use bigger DCB than you would use a stand. But if you have contact with the vessel wall and deliver your truck and you do not implant a stand, then the vessel is allowed to get to its, its natural size. And this, this is the big pro for DCB in STEAM. Great. Do you use DCB in STEMI patients, Michael? Um, not yet, to be quite honest and transparent. I, I think that concept is appealing, um, but um, it, it probably takes time to educate and teach people just, you know, this is what we're doing here. Um, I think, you know, from my old teachers here, I, I always learned that in STEMI, one thing is important, which is to restore flow. It's not so important to really have a fantastic angiographic-like result. And Bruno mentioned the fact that you often undersize stents in the setting of STEMI because of thrombus burden. So I think this is something for us to engage into even in the future. It may be a good concept. And then maybe at a second you know, presentation later on, you can see whether this lesion needs additional treatment by stents or not. OK. Another question is related to the duration of the antiplatelet therapy. 
Uh, actually, I remember we addressed this specific issue in our previous webinar, but very shortly, Bruno, in a patient with stable coronary syndrome, not implanting stent, just drug coated balloon, how long do you recommend to continue the APT? Uh, we do four weeks of the APT, and that's uh, also part of the consensus group recommendation. However, it's only expert opinion. We have no no real data uh, showing us it's better to do it shorter or longer. There will be a, a trial in, in high bleeding risk patients now um, where um, a single uh, antiplatelet therapy after DCB only is investigated versus dual antiplatelet therapy in, in stands with, uh, with a one month uh, DAPT. But in your practice now, what do you do? Um, patients with uh, a high bleeding risk um, that undergo DCB only treatment um, are in most cases uh, treated with single platelet therapy in most cases with, with clobidogrel. Okay. We normally keep dual antiplatelet therapy for one month and then we leave on, on single. And if the patient is extremely high risk, we can rely on single if stents are not implanted. I think it's a very important message that we share with our colleagues. And I, I am trying to approach our final conclusions. We, are, we, we promise to be only five minutes uh, uh, above our time. One of the main messages is considering that uh, there is more risk of stent thrombosis than the risk of acute vessel occlusion after DCB. This is important. At the long-term follow-up, there is a trend towards a higher mortality of implanting more stents in instant restenosis rather than treating patients with DCB. So these are important messages. I think this is something we have to work on and remember. The most demanding decision is whether to leave or not to leave a dissection after the dilatation with the, with the balloon and the drug coating balloon. Of course, this is part of the experience. There are trials and, and, and series now investigating the value of immediate physiology, non-invasive, I mean, non-wire-based, but image-based physiology. And I think that anything which is uh, a QFR above 0.80 could be a good cutoff to be reassuring. Of course, if the patient has chest pain and the flow is low, you must implant stents. This is the, the, this is the rule number one. But implanting stents by default could be not the best thing to do, especially in high bleeding with patients, small vessels, and, and complex lesions. Another message that uh, I want to underline is that fortunately in Europe, European guidelines rec recommend strongly the use of uh, uh, drug coating balloons to treat instant restenosis. This is not the same thing with the American guidelines, but now in the US, there are ongoing trials comparing DCB and stent for instant restenosis. In Europe, we can use them, of course, after the observation of the process of stent failure using IRIS. This is something that, or OCT, this is something we have to remember. Stent failure is very unusual with generation. Sometimes there is something wrong in a mechanic point of view, and sometimes you may need to implant another stent. But it is only neointimal, aggressive hyperplasia. Certainly drug coating balloons are the most reasonable term especially because we don't add additional metallic layers in a vessel that will remain smaller and smaller at the long-term follow-up. And the last point goes to the de novo lesion. It's important to underline that all the available experience shows that the clinical outcome, even a long-term, of the coating balloons in the de novo lesions are equivalent to the use of new generation, second or third generation, whatever you want, a drug eluding stent. So it's an alternative, especially in those patients that are, let's say, candidates for future interventions. We have to think in terms of very long-term follow-up and leaving the arteries free of uh, foreign bodies and metal and, uh, let's say, elements that might make your future interventions more difficult it's a good alternative. So uh, this was dedicated to think about long-term, 
long term is very important for our patients and this technology is offering an alternative. I don't know if you want to add anything else. <clears throat> if I miss something. I think you have nicely summarized the key points of this session. Okay, I thank you again for, for being uh, so, I mean, friendly in this kind of uh, webinar, sharing your experience, your time. And uh, I thank Medtronic for the opportunity of disclosing these cases and, and this long-term follow-up. PCR for the opportunity of sharing these educational opportunities with our colleagues. I thank you very much and I hope to see you again. We are at the end of the year, so we wish you a very nice Christmas and a happy new year. We are very happy, Argentinians, because of the World Cup. So I thank you very much and hope to see you soon on these webinars by PCR. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.